give you Patrick Dobson. In 1994, in May, I was having a really bad day. At that time, I was working at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel, uh, refinishing and repairing the hotel's antique and reproduction furniture. Before that, I had worked in the banquet department, and I had just graduated shortly before that with a master's in history at a time when nobody really needed any historians. So I was working these jobs and feeling in many ways that at 30 years old, my life was ending. I was tired again on that day, and I had been for really months. Uh, it was a regular grind for me to get up and be at work at 7 o'clock and, and get done at 4 o'clock. I mean, these are regular things that people do all the time, but for me, that routine was really bone-crushing, and uh, the kind of work that I was doing was fun at first. Uh, I'm always a really quick starter, and I do very well, but then after about six months, I began rotting because my... Uh, expiration date has passed. So here I was on this day and I was distracted <clears throat> and I was thinking that life really had to have more to offer than just working and dying. I mean, I was sort of looking out on my life and thinking that, you know, I'm going to work day in and day out until I retire and then I'm going to die. And so there had to be something else besides that. Refinishing and repairing antique and reproduction furniture was a great job but it wasn't my life's calling. So I was distracted and thinking this terrible, these terrible thoughts again, and I was doing, I was, at the time I was a new father, a relatively new father, and I wasn't doing very well at it. Uh, my daughter was born two years before, uh, and three years before, I'm sorry, and I was a single dad. Um, her mom and I never got married, uh, and uh, so she was sharing houses, and and I was, I, was, I was just not doing very well. I wasn't very comfortable as a father. I was broke all the time, it seemed. Uh, here I was working and working and working, and I never had anything in the bank. Uh, again, it was just seemed to be getting up in the morning, going to work, coming home, falling, you know, falling dead tired into bed and waking up the next morning. That's what life seemed to be, the sort of repetition of these days. And worse, I was impatient with my daughter, Sydney. Um, there were times when she was with me, those weekends and those weeks when she was with me where I, because I didn't feel very comfortable, I was afraid that I was always going to hurt her in some way, that I would have the wrong kind of discipline, that I would really screw up her whole life by making the wrong move. And due to these, these sort of pressures that I was putting on myself, I really wasn't able to cope very well with life as it presented itself. So on this day, I, like I said, I was tired and distracted and I was painting the floor of the engineering department at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel. We had a Navy man who was uh, in charge, uh, I think he was second in charge of the, of the engineering department, and he liked his floors battleship gray. And so every couple of weeks I would paint the floor of the engineering department because our shoes were so dirty all the time, and of course I was doing the work with the furniture and had all kinds of solvents and stuff. So I was painting that day, and I was sort of thinking these thoughts, and I was really sort of on the edge of despair when I realized that I'd painted myself into the middle of the room. <laughs> this is like a Max Sennett movie, you know? And at that point, I really did despair. I sort of leaned on the, on the, on the broomstick that had the roller on it, and I really did think that this was the way it was always going to be and that I was a failure because of it. In the end, that day, I thought something had to happen. I was standing there in the middle of the floor, and outside, the, the, the door to the do loading dock was open, and outside, a, a thunderstorm sort of sat down on the city. A thunderstorm struck. And it was one of those big ones that gets into, the, gets into your insides. And so, with the rain and the thunder and the smell of rain and fresh grass coming in through the door, something did click. It was like a spring breaking. It wasn't the thought that something had to happen, but the thought that I had to do something, anything, to end my misery. The thunderstorm reminded me of traveling in Kansas. I used to travel in Kansas a lot. I used to get sort of scooped up on the weekends, get into these crushing routines, 
and find myself driving those country roads out in, in central and, and western Kansas. And it reminded me, that thunderstorm reminded me uh, of the times that I was in Kansas and the way that thunderstorms sort of sat at the end of those country roads where the sky really turns that blue-black above the blonde of the prairie itself. And I thought to myself, you know, it's time to walk. And uh, I know that's a strange, it sounds strange to some people, but when I was a kid growing up, we would get in the car every once a year and race across Kansas. My dad absolutely hated Kansas. He thought it was boring. It was the worst place in the world. And we'd race to the mountains. Uh, as a matter of fact, he drove at night sometimes. But to me, looking out that car window, the, just the space itself, the space itself fascinated me. And the way that, that it just seemed so different a world than the one I grew up in. And I lived on State Line Road looking across the street at Kansas. So this was a completely different sort of Kansas that was presented to me. And as I was standing in the middle of that room that day, I thought I wanted to experience that space and that I would walk in it. And I, I'm sure all of you understand what it's like to walk someplace versus whether to drive in it and to be out in the middle of that, uh, all that space, be out underneath the sky and in the land is a completely different experience than driving it. And, and as a matter of fact, over the years, I've come to see driving as more video screen uh, than experience of the actual landscape around me. So I went to experience that space, and I thought to myself, well, I'm going to do this. I'm going to walk. I'm going to walk the Great Plains. And I went home that night and looked for the biggest city farthest away from Kansas City, and that was Helena, Montana, at least on my map. That's what was going through my mind when I decided I was going to walk. And once in my head, I decided I was going to do it. And I was also motivated by this feeling, this fear that overcomes me when I get a thought like that in my head. I, I get this thing in my head and I, and I begin to fear more than, more than uh, embrace things. I, I begin to fear not doing something more than doing it, if that makes any sense. I wind up doing these kinds of things when the fear of not doing them becomes greater than the fear of doing them. And so it was very short order that this became a solidified idea in my head and that I would do it. And it was because, in fact, I thought that if I didn't do it, I never would. The river idea came to me from a kid, my, my, uh, my daughter's brother, not my son, but her brother, uh, said, well, if you're going to go to Montana, if you're going to go all the way to Montana, why don't you just canoe back? And uh, the kid was six at the time. Bo was six years old. And they were studying Lewis and Clark at the time. And so to him, it sounded like a perfectly brilliant idea. Of course, to me, it sounded like a real scary thing. Uh, but I had to ask myself, well, if I'm in Montana, why not canoe home? Uh, it was instantly part of my plan. And I never thought not to do it. So for the next year, I worked in the banquet department and I worked overtime in the engineering department so that I could save five months of money, five months of rent and utilities, five months of what I, would thought, I, what I thought I would need on the road uh, so that I could make this trip. And one of the reasons I wanted to pay rent and utilities was so that when I came home, I would be there with my daughter. I wouldn't have to go look for a new place. She would be able to come over to my house and we'd be able to resume some kind of life together. And I know it sounds almost insane, really, to think that I was going to be away from my house for five months and, not want to, and still want to pay rent for it. But to me, at that particular moment in time, it made perfectly good sense. And part of the reason, part of the reason that the river became such a great idea after Bo mentioned it. As a matter of fact, it was almost instantly the idea that this would happen, was that ever since I was a kid, the river captivated me. I remember, um, everybody here probably remembers, or most people here remember, when the Broadway Bridge was a toll bridge, and uh, you had to pay your quarter to get across it. Well, sometimes in traffic, those cars would back up one behind the other, and uh, you'd get stuck in the middle of the bridge. And that's something by itself to be stuck on a bridge like that because you get to feel the bridge sort of give and take underneath all those cars and all the traffic. Well, looking down then into the river, 
and began to think uh, when I was a kid, just what was that like to be down there? To me, as a kid, it looked like a river. It didn't look like many people would describe it to me later as a trough. You know, it didn't look to me like uh, a man-made construct at all. To me, it was a river, and it was dark, and it was scary. And I remember one time being stuck on the bridge and having one of the uh, big barge packets come through at the same time that we were on that bridge, and it was at night. And to see the lights and the way that they spotlighted the, the, the uh, riverbank as they went along really captivated me. It was so big and so mysterious and so scary all at the same time. Uh, it's still a fixture of uh, dreams of mine to, to see the sort of unmanned, it seemed like, sort of a scary ghost-like thing coming through the river in the middle of the night. So because I found it so intriguing and my school life was not very uh, exciting, um, grade school and high school were awful times for me, uh, I would disappear in grade school into the second story library uh, at Christ King Grade School. And the library was sort of stuck in a corner. You had to actually go looking for it in order to find it. Uh, and so I would disappear in there when I had free times when we had library days. And I would disappear and, and start looking through the encyclopedias and stuff and began to find stuff on the, on the Missouri River. Uh, and when I, I remember I was very proud of myself. Rivers in general uh, captivated me, but the Missouri River as in particular. But I'll never forget when I was in the third grade and I read all of Tom Sawyer in two days. And to me, that was quite a big accomplishment. And of course, there was a lot of river in that book. And later then, I read Huck Finn and of course, didn't quite understand it. I mean, I was only in the third grade, uh, but I certainly ate through that book and was very happy with myself when I finished it five days after I began. Later, when I was in high school, I decided I'd start looking at Missouri River stuff in more particular ways, and I ran into the journals of Prince Maximilian Neuvied and uh, his artist, Carl Bodmer. And so in high school, again, when I was feeling lonely or upset, uh, which was nearly all the time, I would disappear into that library and read through those journals and flip through those beautiful watercolors that Carl Bodmer did uh, in 1833 when he went upstream with Prince Maximilian on the Yellowstone. So I worked over, over time, five months. In May 1995, I began my walk on May 1st. Now, it wasn't an easy trip. I had never walked that far before in my life. I certainly did a lot of walking uh, when I was younger, and uh, I came to know cities that I lived in fairly well from walking them. Uh, when, I was, when I was 22, I lived in Trier in Germany, and because I didn't know anybody, I would spend hours and hours walking. So I, I'd walked a fair deal, but I'd never walked a long way with a backpack on my back on hard surface roads. And so I learned a lot about what you need in terms of shoes and equipment and so on, and a lot about what you don't need. Uh, I had packed all this stuff thinking that I was going to need it, like I was on, going on a backpacking trip in Missouri for a weekend. And it turns out that to walk to Montana, you need a whole lot less stuff. Uh, and certainly on those hard surface roads, in the heat uh, and, and in the rain, uh, it was a very difficult time for me. I was very scared, really, almost all the way until I got to Guernsey, Wyoming. And I really experienced the very first day without any kind of anxiety. Now, it never occurred to me to turn around and go home. It never occurred to me that this was something I wasn't going to do, so I kept doing it. And I did it at 1,450 miles all the way to the Missouri River. When I arrived at the river, I had another thought, and that is I'd never really been in a canoe before. And uh, during that year that I worked so hard, I also queried canoe makers and... Um, magazines and stuff to see if I could write notes from the road, sort of a journal thing. Uh, and the only place that uh, said yes to the journal thing was Pitch, Pitch Weekly. And, uh, and later I came to work there because the, the walk and the river trip really began my, my uh, career as a writer. But I arrived at that river and realized uh, that this was a real grown-up river. This wasn't some sort of mountain stream. Uh, below that, uh, below Holter Dam, uh, below, below Holter Lake, uh, that river was not what I saw when I went through Three Forks. When I went through Three Forks, that's still something that you could understand as a, as a stream, as, a, as a, something that I could handle. But when I wound up there at the Wolf Creek Access uh, in Montana, 
uh, all of a sudden that was something that it was very difficult for me to imagine doing. I spent two days on that bank, sort of dilly-dallying around, sort of putting things off, hoping that, that this would make things better. Again, it never occurred to me to get to, to walk back to Helena and get on a bus and come home. That canoe maker had sent that. He made a canoe. He'd send it to Helena, Montana for me, gratis. And I had that big, beautiful boat on the side of the river, and I was scared to get in it. The evening, the second evening I was there, two guys came up. One was a school teacher and the other one was a lawyer. And they had this really leaky little 12-foot boat that they put on the river. Uh, and they spent weekends, uh, weeknights, they would go out and then they'd go the five miles from Wolf Creek Access to Craig, Montana. And they invited me along. And it looked so natural and normal for them to be in this boat and to go down the river. Uh, and they really showed me a great time. I and mean, we smoked cigars, fat cigars. Uh, I did some fly casting while we were out there. They drank whiskey because I don't drink. Um, but it really looked like they wore the river as they would their favorite sweater. And here I was so frightened of it. So I got this sort of confidence. Then there, the next day then I put that boat in the river and really felt, like, felt what it was to be on the river for the first time. But while I was dawdling, this is a sort of side note, while I was dawdling, I had been trying to convince myself that I really could do this thing. My boat's there on the bank. I have my little tent. And about the time I get myself convinced that I'm going to take off the next morning, a truck bounces in down on the river access with a bunch of McKinsey drift boats. I'm, I'm not sure if you know what those are, but they're a certain kind of boat. It's very uh, familiar to that uh, upper river. And trailer full of boats and a whole bunch of dudes, literally in the sense of the word dudes, uh, in the trucks and in cars. And the woman who was in charge was barking orders at these other guys who were help working for her, and they were filling coolers with beer and, and I guess fat cigars for these guys. They were all perfect fly fishing outfits, all fresh from the Orvis store. And so once they got on the river, she came down and sat on my picnic bench, and she was a heavy smoker. She smoked and then lit the next one with the cigarette before. She says, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I, I came all the way. I walked here. I, I walked here, and I'm going home on that river. First thing she said to me after that was, you're doomed. <laughs> it's a flood, your boy. That river's going to eat you. And I put on that voice because that's really the voice that she had, was this deep, gravelly voice. And so all of a sudden, all that confidence that I had disappeared. After all, this was somebody who was on the river every day or every other day, and she was telling me that I was doomed and uh, that the river was going to eat me up. Fortunately, I ran into those two guys, and they really showed me something else. Now, while I was sitting there on the riverbank, and while I was doing my first day in the, in the boat, I had to ask myself, what was I really looking for? And what I was looking for unfolded as the river trip, as the walking trip first, and then as the river trip unfolded. Um, on the river, of course, I would be more alone than in any other time in my life. There was nobody there to distract me. There was nobody to blame anything on. Anything that happened, it happened because I put myself into it. So I'd be more alone, and I'd be looking inside as never before. And I, I don't know how you feel about looking inside yourself, but to me at that particular moment in life, still is kind of really frightening stuff to look inside. I found the opportunities to be very, very frightening, as I said, and exciting at the same time. I'd never done this before, and now I was committed, and it was something that I had to do. At the time, of course, I wasn't very self-aware. I'd only been sober for about five years before I got on that river, and I was still trying to figure out what life was going to be. I drank really my whole life, from the time I was 11 to the time I was 27. And so here I was on the river, actually looking at back at my existence and this, in these bone-crushing routines and trying to figure out how did I come to get stuck in these things time and time again. So I had all of this time then and all of these reasons to look inside. I think I started the trip to challenge myself. 
And I really wanted to have something to write about because that's all I've ever wanted to do since I was a little kid was be a writer. And I believed all those things that people told me when they said I couldn't be a writer, that I'd never be able to compete, that I'd never be good enough. Well, this was the trip that was going to make me a writer, and I was determined to do it. I found very quickly that I was looking for a sense of purpose. I really had none, no idea of purpose before, other than to stay sober and make enough money to pay the rent. So I was rather adrift in life and had no plans. And so that's why the bone-crushing routines happened again and again, because I was just sort of going from one thing to the other. I wanted the strength to be a father, but at the same time, you know, I left my kid in Kansas City for five months in the care of her mother. I left my kid, but I left her for, I thought, at that time, and I still think to, to today for a very good reason, and that was to show my daughter that there was something more in life than just taking what came, than just working and dying. There has to be something more. And hopefully, by my example, she will have learned that herself. And I think she has to some extent. And mo most, more than anything, of course, I just wanted life to be different. The river put me to the test. Like I said, I had no experience on the river. The only time I had ever been in a canoe was a drunken weekend canoe on one of those mid-Missouri or southern Missouri streams. I began to drink on Friday afternoon and still don't know how I made it home. So I, I got home. Monday morning came. And I have no idea what happened between Friday afternoon and Monday morning. So that was the whole of my canoeing experience. I only had the barest notion, the barest idea of how to control that boat. When I was in Helena, uh, one of the people I asked, one of the people at the sporting goods store that took the canoe, and I asked them, I said, do you know anybody who gives canoe lessons? And they're like, you got a canoe and you're going to need canoe lessons? Like, you know, these were all like, these really buff, tanned, beautiful Montana outdoor people, and they couldn't believe that I needed a canoe uh, lesson. But they hooked me up with this guy who was a known, and they told me this, a known, well-known whitewater, whitewater canoeist in Montana. And so he t we got the boat out of the store, took it to uh, Mon uh, Helena City Lake, and then he yelled at me for about an hour and a half while I turned the boat over and sloshed around, and, and it felt ashamed because he was, he was saying things like, I can't understand. How come you can't do a simple J-stroke? And I was J-ing and prying and, and north of, touring North America. He called it the North, Ameri North American touring technique, where you just paddle on both sides of the boat. And uh, so after that, I was completely humiliated. And uh, I never thought to ask the guy until after the lesson what I asked him, which was, had you ever been on the Missouri? Have you ever been on the Missouri River? Oh, no, no, that river's too big. It's too dangerous. <laughs> so here I have this big blonde hourglass of a human being telling me that he's too frightened to get on the river, and I'm going to do it with flipping the boat over in, in a hell in a, in a hell in a Montana city pond. So I took off. That day I felt real good. I made it to Craig and and five miles away, I made it in less than an hour. And it had taken us, me and the two guys, it had taken us several hours the night before. So I, I had all the confidence in the world. But I really wasn't ready for what happened. Uh, what happened was the landscape and the quiet. It was sublime. Uh, I'm sure that we have some people here who have done a lot of paddling before. But again, when you're loosed in that space and with that kind of quiet, some very amazing things happen to the inside of you. And so after that first day, when I landed at Cascade, Montana, my very first camp, uh, I really had all the confidence in the world. I really thought that I'd learned a lot that day and that I could do this canoe thing fairly easily. The next day, however, I was sort of canoeing along and got real complacent and decided I'd take a nap in my boat. And I woke up in the middle of a thunderstorm, lightning storm in the middle of the stream. And, uh, you know, I, I, what woke me up was that a wave crashed into the side of the boat and I splashed my face and I woke up and I'm panicked all of a sudden. And I realized that I really don't know anything about this canoeing thing. 
and I try to figure out whether I'm supposed to go to the cut bank or the lee bank, and there's, there's cottonwoods on the lee bank, and I, in all my time outside, I'd seen cottonwood splinter in, in heavy thunderstorms. Uh, one time in Montana, I was actually fishing the Platte River, the North Platte River, and actually had a, had a, a whole cottonwood come off a cliff, on to, uh, not on top of me, but fairly close to me, so I didn't want to do that. But at some point, the panic set in, and I was just going to do anything I could. And I finally decided, uh, I don't know how I decided, it just decided, that uh, even though the lightning would get the cottonwoods first, and then I would get it right after, I was going to dive in underneath those cottonwoods and, and test my luck. And I pushed into the cottonwoods, pulled some willow around the, around the cross brace, around the yoke in the boat, and uh, by that time, hail had begun. And it wasn't just pea-sized hail. This became really serious marble-sized hail. And uh, so I, thrashing around, I pulled those willows around the yoke of the boat to hold it in, ripped open my bag, pulled out a uh, terry cloth towel and threw it over the back of my head and my neck to lessen the blow of the hail because by that time it had gotten bigger than marbles. And uh, it was really... It was really frightening. I think I did a lot of screaming and yelling, and about halfway through that, one of those branches on the cottonwood fell down next to the canoe and sloshed water in the boat, and I'm curled into this really tight ball, and I barely notice when it stops, right? I mean, it, it just, all of a sudden, I realize that I'm sort of out of danger, and there's pearls and agates in the boat, right? Two inches of hail in the boat, and so I got out in this ridiculously small little pan I had, and I begin to bail the boat out, and uh, actually came around the corner, got back into the, into the stream, and, and was grateful to have my life, and I came around the corner, and there was the park I wanted to stay at that night, and I just laughed myself silly. <laughs> of course, I ran into rapids. If you've been, ever, been up on the Missouri, upper Missouri, there are rapids. It's not like whitewater rapids. Uh, instead, they're like huge stair steps where the river just sort of falls down into these standing waves. And so uh, I saw the first of these, I think it was the Dauphin rabbit, rabbits, ra Rapids, and um, I thought to myself, my boat would be crushed, I mean, if I was going to go through these big waves. And so I got smart. I thought I got smart and saw a chute on the side of the river, and I thought, well, I'll just walk my boat down to where it's calm at the bottom. Well, I got into the chute, and it was really great. Everything was fantastic. And then within about 100 feet, my feet are swept out from underneath me. I'm struggling to hold on to the boat. And somehow I flop myself into the boat and start paddling like crazy because I'm so afraid I'm getting washed against these rocks. And this is serious standing wave stuff where my boat is crashing through the white water and, and then coming through on the other side, flipping up and down. And uh, I finally came through on the... Uh, the, in the calm water below all of these rapids and uh, went to the, the opposite bank and there was a guy standing there in a fly fishing outfit. This guy didn't look like a dude. He looked like a real deal. And I said, he, said, uh, he said, how'd you do in there? And I said, well, I don't think I did very well. And he said, well, I could tell by your English. I could hear you all the way out here. <laughs> So that's the beginning of the trip. Uh, as I move forward in the trip, I mean, I have a lot of, I'll show you some pictures of the upper Missouri wild and scenic. But it, when I was up in Montana, it was the windiest time of the year, and some people told me that it was the windiest year they'd had in 50 years up there. So I made it through the upper Missouri wild and scenic, which was, if you've never been there in a boat, uh, or even in person, just by yourself, you should do that. It's really a magnificent, lonely, lonely place. It is really just sublimely beautiful. But so I get on to get through the Upper Missouri Wild and Scenic and into Fort Peck Lake, and I think to myself, well, all these stories people told me must not be true. Of course, that was the day that the wind wasn't blowing, and I made 25 miles into the lake, and I thought I was so brilliant. This is going to be really easy and whatnot. Uh, after that, I was completely shut down by the wind. Uh, I, in the next five days, I made 10 miles. Most of those miles, eight or nine of them in the first days, uh, I put my boat on the river every day, and one day I paddled all day, and I struggled to make 300 yards. 
I'm paddling up the sides of these swells, right? These four and five foot swells. Uh, I'm trying to stay close to the bank so that I could get out. The wind's pushing me out into open water. And then I get to the top of one of these swells and I have to paddle back down the other side in order to keep from being blown backward. Um, fortunately, um, I only had to go one, really one, one open water stretch. Uh, that was where the Crooked Creek comes in to the Missouri at the UL Bend Wilderness. There was a little Corps of Engineers wreck site there, and there was a trailer there, and that's all I could see, but I thought this is going to be it. And I got out in the middle of this lake, and I began to curse uh, uh, the name of Fra uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt for having built the lake during his administration. And if anybody knows me, for me to curse Franklin Delano Roosevelt is quite something. Uh, so here I was out there, and I was cursing and, and screaming, and, and I was very mad at the Corps of Engineers. I was uh, really frustrated not having uh, anything to hold on to, li really literally anything to hold on to out in the middle of that. And I finally was able, over after a time, to actually surf my boat, get on the top of a swell and surf toward the shore over and over again until I wound up on that other shore. And there I met a guy by the name of Kevin Scobie. I'll show you his picture here in a minute. And Kevin was one of these weird people who liked to spend all of their time alone, uh, but he's still very friendly at the same time. And uh, he invited me to stay uh, over, over the weekend where a lot of ranchers would come down over the weekend. We could have a good time together. And then uh, when the next day came and I began to look out at that lake and it was smooth again and I thought maybe I should get going because I may not have this opportunity again, uh, Kevin said, well, where, where do you think you're going? I'm going to take you around this lake. And I was just stunned. I mean, this guy out of nowhere just said, oh, yeah, I'll take you around the lake, no big deal. And so I did. I spent the whole week with him, and he took me to Wolf Point, Montana. Um, and uh, then I canoed then into Lake Sakakawea. Uh, I would read the journal of a, another, a kayaker uh, who... Um, I should back up a minute. When I got to Great Falls... I met a, an incredible couple by the name of Jim and Diane McDermott, and they took me around the Great Falls to Fort Benton. And uh, they gave me a lot of good advice, like when you're in the canoe by yourself, you turn it around, put the stern forward. I had no idea. I was sitting all the way in the back of my boat with the boat sitting up like this. Uh, they had all kinds of great advice, and they gave me this journal of this kayaker. And what the kayaker wrote in this journal was that he stashed his boat in the bushes underneath a highway bridge at Williston, Montana, went up and got a shower, had a good meal, and came back then two or three days later. And I thought, that that's the thing that's going to happen. That's what's going to happen with me. And I did that. And while I was walking into, into Williston, I met somebody who was real nice to me, took me around, bought me lunch, introduced me to the best hotel in Williston, Montana at the time. And then as I got done that evening, I was worrying over how I was going to make it through all these big lakes. There was another 650 miles of big lake in front of me. And I sat down on the bench in, in Williston, Montana, I mean, Williston, North Dakota, and a woman came up and introduced herself, Doris Hansen. She looked out of place. She had a big bouffant hair, uh, hair you know, with a, with a polyester scarf wrapped around it and big hormone glasses, and we got to talking, and she said, well... I have a friend who goes down to Yankton all the time. You should go with him. And I was just stunned. I was another sort of incident. I thought, well, this woman's crazy. She talks too loud, and uh, she just seemed to be sort of presumptuous. And so she got up right away, and we went down to talk to her friend by the name of Rick Hickok. And uh, Rick said, oh, yeah, I'll take you around Yankton. I mean, I'll take you down to Yankton. You don't mind staying with Doris for a week, do you? So I said, I don't know what that means. <laughs> uh, and uh, Doris took me out to dinner. And while we were at dinner, she was just so happy to be with me and so open and so honest. And she uh, revealed to me that she had just gotten out of the mental hospital about three weeks before. <laughs> Turned out she had been in her house, shut in her house after her husband left her. She shut herself in her house for five years. 
She even unplugged the clock so she wouldn't know what time it was, you know, pulled the shades and so on. And her ex-husband and her friends, they were the people who brought cleaning supplies and food to her. She stayed in that house for five years. And so when it became obvious that something was very wrong with Doris, her ex-husband and the chief of police had her committed, and she wound up spending, I think, three months in a, in a uh, psychiatric institution. And she had just gotten out three weeks before she met me, and I had the most wonderful week. Uh, <laughs> she cooked dinner. She'd get big bags of potato chips and ice cream, and we'd sit on her patio and eat these things. And... Uh, and uh, I went to five movies that week. I saw all the movies that were showing at the two theaters in Williston, Montana. Uh, so she was really, Doris was a real find. And I, of course, very sad to, to, to know that just a few years after I'd met her, uh, she died, uh, uh, hopefully not of alcoholism or a heart attack, but uh, or she just died, and it made me very sad. Um, so Rick took me. He drove 750, drove me and my boat 750 miles to Yankton, Montana. I mean, Yankton, South Dakota, and uh, put me on the river below the Gavin's Point Dam. Now, there I ran into a river that's much more familiar to us living on the lower river. Uh, rolling hills, grapevines, uh, the kinds of reeds that we have on the riverbank. Um, for the next 60 miles from Gavin, Gavin's Point Dam to Ponca State Park, the river lulled really fat and warm as a puddle in the sun. And so I took my time. I mean, I had skipped all this river, and I had this growing feeling that I wanted to be back with my daughter, but I really didn't want the trip to end. And so in the Missouri National Recreation River, I took my time. I really tried to put off going downstream because I didn't want my river trip to end. I was by myself for a week and a half on the way into Omaha, and all the way along, of course, you begin to realize differences of the upper river and the lower river. Of course, on the lower river, there's more human sounds, more mechanical sounds, there's more sounds of cars and traffic, but it wasn't that bad. I liked that after having been alone for so long uh, on, the, on the upper river and, and not hearing anything. There are times when I was on the upper river when there wasn't wind, when there wasn't any ripple in the stream where I could literally hear my, my heart beat in my ears. So I liked it. I mean, I liked being by myself in the middle of all this. It feels, it's a great feeling to feel that you're a thousand miles away from everybody, even though you're in the middle of a town. And in Omaha, I met a guy by the name of John Biondo. I'd heard about him upstream. Uh, some jet skiers caught me near Blair, Nebraska, and uh, asked me what was going on. They just met this guy who was having a terrible trip, blah, blah, blah. And I was canoeing through Omaha, and I saw an opening. There's a harbor there with a bar on the other end of it. And I thought what I really wanted at that time was a candy bar and a cola. If you've been alone out there in the sun on the river for a long time, that sugar stuff really begins to sound very good. And so I dashed in there, uh, and I met John Biondo at the bar. He was writing in his journal. It was the middle of the day. It was actually about 11 o'clock. Uh, they'd had some big party the night before. The bartender had bloodshot eyes, and there were people sweeping up and, and just not looking like they were having a good time of it, and it was already 103 outside. And I thought to myself, well, how about if we canoe together? And in my head, I said, I'm going to beg this guy. I'm going to beg because I'd been by myself, it'd be fun to have a river mate uh, to go with me. Turns out that John had done the same thing I did. He went from Fort Peck Lake around to Yankton, South Dakota. Actually, he canoed even less river than I did, and he uh, had broken up with a girlfriend right before he went on this trip. He was lonely and alone, and he was really into Indian artifacts, and the river was up, so he couldn't search around on gravel bars for Indian artifacts, and he had just all these reasons that he was having a terrible time. And so I talked him in to go on with me. I told him, look, you know, a couple of days, a couple of days. If you don't like it, you can get out of the river and go home. That's always there for you. Uh, being able to canoe with somebody else and having a good time building big fires and shooting guns, that doesn't happen very often. Of course, I didn't have the guns. He had the guns, and I wanted my fingers on them too because it's like a free fire zone out there. It was kind of fun. I'm not a gun guy. I don't own one, but it still was going to be a lot of fun if I could talk him into going. I could shoot his guns. 
And uh, from that point, I had the best two weeks of my entire life to that point. Um, John and I lived like a couple of Huck Finns. Um, we didn't put on our shoes for two weeks running. Uh, we came by a, a sandbar we liked, and we stayed there for two nights. Uh, we shot guns, we fished, we screwed around, we built big, big fires, we wrote and read in the sun. And that took me all the way into Kansas City. The whole time that John and I were together, after the first day or so, we kept talking about how much longer we wanted the river to be. Because life on the river really is something very special. And having been alone and on that river for two and a half months, you know, the prospect of it ending was very, very difficult to take. I wanted to go home and be with my kid. I didn't want to go home and get a job. I didn't want to go home and pay bills. I didn't want to go home and be an upstanding human being, but I wanted to go home and be with my kid. But at the very same time, I wanted the river between Omaha and Kansas City to get longer. Now, I arrived on the riverbank at, at uh, Caw Point. Uh, the riverboat was still there. I was able to call a friend of mine to come pick me up. And I realized at that moment that I really was home. And uh, it took me a while to understand how much the river really transformed me. Uh, being out there by myself, looking for the things that I was looking for. I didn't find everything that I was looking for. Uh, and in some ways, the river is still transforming my life uh, with further trips on it as well as the lessons that I learned. And what I learned really from all of this was that I'm not a finished product, that in fact, I'm a work in progress. And I think when I left, I wanted to come back to a completely different life, and that's not what happens on river trips. River trips show you, I think, or showed me anyway, who I was, and began to really show me that my best qualities are dealing with things as they come, not as I imagine them. And so... Um, I go into, I'm still very scared a lot. I still think a lot about, uh, you know, if I don't do this, then I never will and all of that. But I'm more able to cope with the everyday realities because the river really showed me that if I just do one thing at a time, just one thing and then the next thing after that, life's going to be just fine. I'd like to show you some pictures of the river right now. This is it. This is Sydney. She was three years old when we took this picture. This is what she looked like when uh, I conceived the river as an idea and the walk across the Great Plains as a way of transforming my life. She was really, at that point, the reason I was taking the trip. And I know that it sounds odd to some people that you would leave your kid for five months in order to find your kid. But that's exactly the way it was and exactly what happened. It's what I kept, why I kept going when I did. Uh, it's probably why I never thought to get on a bus and come back home. This, of course, is my first camp in uh, Cascade, Montana, the end of that first night. When I was walking to Montana, I actually had a, or gained very quickly a sense of decorum. I was camping in public, at public parks, in people's front yards. I was sort of, uh, people offered me uh, their couches and their living rooms, they, uh, they, they just spontaneously offered me this. I mean, I met literally hundreds of people on the way to Montana. So I, I came to have this sort of practice where at night I would sort of make sure all my stuff was in order, that I didn't have undies laying out, that my socks, you know, those kinds of things, because this was in the public. Of course, first night on the river, all that disappears. When I looked out of my tent, I actually was in my tent when I took this picture and thought, man, a bomb hit, you know, uh, because I'd lost really all sense of decorum. I was out on my own and certainly free to do it. Now that bit from Montana, how many people have ever been up in the upper Missouri Wild and Scenic River? So you already know some of what I'm talking about. You'll probably recognize some of these pictures. But of course, you're out there. I'm out there in that lonely place or I'm out there all by myself and these scenes of the cut bank, this is a cut bank near uh, old Montana, um, it really did strike me as something very beautiful. And of course, you get a sense of loneliness if you look at this picture. There is a human in the picture, 
but he's looking out at really open country. This is Jim and Diane McDermott. When I met them in Great Falls, I, the last telephone call I made, I mean, I, was, I got out of the river and I thought, well, I'm going to call these canoeing clubs or I'm going to try to find somebody who knows how to get around these big dams uh, and the, around the Great Falls. And it was the, some woman in a coffee shop was very nice. She gave me a telephone book, sat me down in her office where I could use the telephone. I made about 15 calls to sporting goods stores and uh, outdoor uh, equipment places. And at the very last one, someone said, oh, yeah, you ought to call the Medicine River Canoe Club. And I was like, well, how do I get a hold of them? Diane answered the phone, and uh, they put me up at their house that night. Uh, them and some other people took me around town for a day or so, and then they took me to Fort Benton, Montana, which is the start of the Upper Missouri Wild and Scenic. Now, the river at Fort Benton doesn't look like this. This is very shortly after Fort Benton. We get into the uh, White Cliffs country. Uh, it's more subtle. There's more brown. There's more, but it's still, like I said, very lonely up there. It's very, uh, there's not much next to the river outside of Fort Benton uh, for many, many miles, actually probably all the way to the Kip Recreation Area uh, near Malta, Montana. But this is the White Cliffs region. Uh, this is Labarge Rock, named after uh, Joseph Labarge, a, a riverboat captain that plied the Missouri, Upper Missouri River in the 1860s through the 1880s. This, uh, these formations you see are white sandstone, and every now and then there are these volcanic dikes uh, that stick up in them, and you'll see some more here in a second. Um, but to me, seeing Labarge Rock was like magical. Because I had looked at all of those Carl Bodmer watercolors and dreamed about them for years and years. And all of a sudden, I'm there. I mean, I'm living it in a way, right? This is like my dreams come true. Of course, this is across the way from uh, Eagle, uh, Eagle Rock Campground. It's just this lonely little spit of land with some fire rings on it that the... Uh, uh, Park Service keeps up in the Upper Missouri Wild and Scenic. Really brilliant, brilliant white cliffs, beautiful white cliffs. This is above Eagle Creek. Uh, and I didn't realize, I, I mean, I realized it at the time, obviously, but I didn't realize later how much hiking I actually did up from the river. I think I spent a good portion of every day hiking up into the plains above uh, the river, above the coulees, and above all the ravines. And so up on the, you can see, you can't really see the river here, but it's behind that second uh, row of rocks in front of the third. So I'm pretty far away from, uh, from the river itself. This is Eagle Creek Canyon. It's about 60 feet across at the very top and probably not as wide as my shoulders at the bottom. This is Citadel Rock. And like I said, uh, I was living the dream. I mean, this is a Carl Bodmer picture of that same formation. This one here, I mean, I saw that come into my vision and I thought, oh my God, I almost died and went to heaven. This is, uh, I can't remember exactly where this is, but these are part of the White Cliffs region. Like I said, I'd, I'd hike up behind the, behind the cliffs up onto the thing and I'd have these great vistas, these fantastic views and stuff that Lewis and Clark described in their, uh, in the journals as grotesque forms and sort of, out of you know, uh, otherworldly sorts of formations. This is uh, another hike from the river. There's the White Cliffs runs for about 100 miles in the Upper Missouri Wild and Scenic River. This is Pilot Butte, another one of those volcanic dikes that just sticks up. And again, it's part of, a, part of what Carl Bodmer painted in those wonderful water, watercolors uh, that are now all in the Jocelyn Museum in Omaha, Nebraska. This here, I can't remember the name of the formation, but it's also part of a Bodmer watercolor. Of course, the river shifts a lot between the time, between 1833 and today, uh, but it's the same formation. Uh, I wish I could have seen bison while I was up there, but uh, they're mostly, most of that land's left over to cows these days. This is hole in the wall. You can see, if you look close, there's a little hole in the wall. It's a formation that runs about 450 feet above the river. It is literally a rock wall, uh, and here's the hole in the wall from above. Uh, when I hiked up, uh, up, up onto that narrow wall, I actually walked all the way out to that point, 
and just leaned into the wind. Uh, it was frightening, it was scary, but it was so beautiful and I could see so far. Uh, this is on one side of the rock wall, these mushroom gardens on either side of the hole in the wall. And this is Cow Creek. Now, Cow Creek has its own story. If you remember history very well, it was the last clash uh, between the Nez Pierce, Chief Joseph Nez Pierce and the American Army happened at Cow Creek Island. The island is no longer there. Uh, as a matter of fact, below those branches, that's where the island once was. We were looking across the Missouri River to Cow Creek, and it uh, slithers around in there like a big snake, hundreds and hundreds of turns and crooks in that river all the way up to its, um, uh, all the way up to its source up on the plain. But I got to tell you that this is where it all came together. It was so peaceful and so quiet that I thought if people have souls like they told me about in grade school then this is where they come when after somebody dies I have never been in a place more serene and more beautiful and more subtle in my entire life they headed into the breaks country of course the ground changes a lot the landscape changes you get into these big break these big what they call breaks or coulees uh, these ravines on either side of the river here we have another Carl Bodmer picture of a buffalo herd coming down one of the uh, breaks in the river. This is uh, below uh, the, uh, the upper, this is on the last tail end of the upper, upper Missouri wild and scenic. Here where things get more subtle. The colors are, are really much more nuanced uh, and no less beautiful than in the White Rocks region. This is one of my typical camps. This is at the Judith River. Uh, which is a BLM campsite uh, that they keep uh, on the Upper Missouri Wild and Scenic. So you can see my coffee, my water's there boiling for coffee. Uh, it's the end of a good day. This is Kevin Scobie. I named him my savior because he got me off that big lake and out of that scary stuff and got me back to a river that actually flowed. And I want to just, the, I have these other pictures from another trip, from other trips that I made on the Missouri River just to sort of show you the contrast between the upper and the lower Missouri. You all are familiar with this, but the, one of the things that we don't often think about is how beautiful the lower river is. You can see a white dot on the front of that pile of drift. That's my friend Gary Jenkins, and that's just how big this uh, sandbar was uh, north of Franklin, Missouri, or I'm, sure, I'm sorry, west of Franklin, Missouri. This course is the river in the evening. Maybe uh, anybody who's canoed the river gets to understand what this means when all the wind is settled down and the sky and the river almost become one. This is at Little LaBeouf Creek where uh, it's storied or told that John Coulter was buried just up the creek from here. There's my friend Gary Jenkins. Uh, and the only reason we ever set up a tent was against the bugs. I learned on the way to Montana how not to sleep in a tent, and I still don't sleep in a tent. The only time I sleep in a tent is when there's bugs or if it's going to rain, and even if it's going to rain, I still have a ground cut or a, a canvas that I use instead of a tent. This is at Franklin Island. I mean, just this real subtle stuff, and unless we stop, slow down, take a look at it, it escapes us. Glasgow, uh, you guys are familiar, I imagine, with Glasgow, Missouri. Uh, and it's interesting, too, how when you frame these things with a camera, how you can sort of pick out the beauty. You, sometimes it's too much for us to understand if we're looking at the whole thing. Uh, a picture like this, to me, brings back a memory and a time, uh, as well as a landscape, to me, that is very, very beautiful. Missouri's Rhineland region. region. Um, that's Gary there in the front of the canoe. Uh, that canoe I was telling some people before got stolen from me. I've had almost 5,000 miles on that canoe uh, when it got stolen from me. And it was a big loss. And I just just recently bought a brand new canoe. It's, I, I shouldn't say just recently. A day and a half ago, bought a brand new canoe. Uh, same profile as the one that I had before that the canoe maker in Maine had gotten me. Uh, it's really brilliant. I'm very happy to have it. And I can't wait to get out on the river again. Labadee Bottoms, and if you've ever canoed to St. Louis, you know that Labadee on one side is this really beautiful swampy area where the Labadee Creek comes out, 
and on the other side is a huge power plant. But these two things living side by side to me uh, make this very interesting sort of contrasts that uh, unless we're looking for it, we miss. There's Gary again on the way to the Columbia Bottoms, and there's Pelican Island. Uh, again, the, when the wind dies down and there's only sounds perhaps of the highway behind you, uh, the river is sort of really lovely, beautiful place. Here's Pelican Island again. This is John Biondo. He's still a friend of mine. We actually had a text mail or a text message uh, um, conversation yesterday. I've known him these whole, all these years uh, between now and then. He and I have traveled the river again before. He met us at Weldon Springs when uh, we went down to Missouri in 2009. And there's your wayfarer at the Columbia Bottoms. And I want to thank every one of you for being here for me tonight. Uh, I hope somebody has questions for me.